Before we get into the story of Sopos of the First, who founded the Swazi nation, I need to set the scene for you. At the time of Sopos's rule, he was the king of the Wane people. Um, and his journey towards establishing the Swazi people in Eswatini was not linear. His path would cross with three prominent kingdoms at the time. That's the Zulu, then Teta, and then Doandu Kingdom. And his shrewd maneuvering around those superpowers would ultimately lead to him setting up the Swazi people in Eswatini. Right, let's begin. King Sopoza the first was born around the year 1788. His family belonged to the Lamini clan, which was an important group in the Ngwane tribe. He was born to his father, Nvongunye, also known as Zikode, and his mother, Somjalose Similani. When he was born, a lightning strike made his father fall ill, so he was called Somfolo, which means mysterious person. Sopuza's mother, Somjalose, was the younger sister of Lochi Basimelane, who was Mvongonye's main wife. Sobuza's father was the king of the Mwanye tribe, and his family's lineage was important in the region's society and politics. While growing up, Sobuza learned about tribal relationships and leadership between the different tribes from his father, traditions, stories, and rules he learned as a child influence how he made his decisions later on as a leader. When his father Ndwonye passed away in 1815, Sobuza became the king of the Ndwonye tribe. Because he was the son of a co-wife, Sobuza was considered Lojiba's classifactory son and Ndwonye royal kinship and succession principles. Thus, Sobuza became the heir to his father. However, it was Lojiba, not his mother, who became the Queen Mother. Sobuza's rule coincided with the Mfetami, a period of widespread wars and bloodshed in Southern Africa. From the 1820s to the 1840s, there were many battles and conflicts. There were multiple reasons for these conflicts, but two most important ones were the fact that King Shagazulu was expanding and he was conquering tribes within the Southern African region. Another reason was the Majatule famine, which translates to eat and be silent. Before this time, tribes usually got along, but during the Mfetani, stronger groups conquered weaker ones. The Mteto people had achieved great success during this period, and defeated clans would follow King Dingiswayo. However, Dingiswayo didn't fully control them directly. He used a confederation which is a group of united but separate clans. The Ndwandu tribe, to the north of the Ntetwa, had the turbulent king, King Zwide, as their leader. He lost to Dingiswai twice and was even captured, but he was set free unharmed. Despite being defeated by Dingiswai twice, Zwide would then begin conflict with the Ngwane people led by Sopuza. Contact between the Ngwane and the Ndwandu had generally been friendly previously. This was cemented by intermarriages and by shared traditions and language. To make peace with Zwide, Sobuza proposed marriage to Tandile, the daughter of Zwide. And so, Tandile journeyed north to meet her spouse, where she became Sobuza's chief wife and had a son named Swati. And Swati would later become the next leader after Sobuza's passing. Sobuza might have thought that the strategic move of marrying his rival's daughter, Tandile, would keep his tribe safe from the Ndwandwe. However, this was not the case. Zwide had ambitions to expand Ndwandwe territory, and having recently conquered other smaller clans, he turned his attention to Sobuza. In 1820, Zwide threatened to attack the Ndwandwe tribe, who were based in the Shiselweni region. This was a pivotal moment for Sobuza. After a short war, he lost to Zwide and moved his people north of the Usutu River. They settled near the Nzimba Mountains. And because of historical and familial connections, Sobuza built alliances and got tributes from other chiefs north of the Usutu River. He moved northwest to the Romo Hills and he made further agreements with chiefs in that region. 
Meanwhile, back in the Shiseroeni region, the Ndwanda tribe's power was declining because of the Zulu warriors. And so, in 1820, the Battle of Mshatuze River unfolded between the Zulu and the Ndwanda tribes, in which the Ndwanda were defeated by the Zulu, thus ending Ndwanda dominance in Shiseroeni. Following this, Zwida's generals and sons fled. The Ndwandwe were fractured, but not completely destroyed after the Battle of Mshatuze. And for some time, they settled on the upper Kongolo River. However, Shaka's victory over Zwide did not elevate Shiseloini settlements to their former prominence. A time of relative calm followed, because Shaka was busy conquering lands to the south and the east. Sobuza cleverly used this peaceful time to his advantage. He worked to bring order to the clans in the Shiseloeni region. Sobuza rewarded those who were loyal and recognized the Mamba chieftain's independence. He also gave some people important roles. Sobuza used a friendly approach to encourage loyalty and to make defenses stronger against attacks from the Ndwandwe and the Zulu. It has been suggested that Sobuza and Shaka had a good relationship and were friendly. Their bond might have been strong enough to prevent the Zulu invasion. In 1824, the Zulu started trading with the British in Port Natal. The Zulu bought guns and other manufactured goods from the British. It's believed that Shaka's access to firearms made him attack the Ndwanya tribe again in 1826. Traders from Port Natal helped Shaka in this attack. The Ndwanya, led by Zwede's successor, Skunyani, were defeated at Izondorani Hills, and many of their cattle were seized. The Ndwanya kingdom completely collapsed, and many people either swore loyalty to the Zulu or fled. After the destruction of the Ndwanya tribe and Sobuza's reassertion of leadership, a pivotal moment in the kingdom's history emerged. Sobuza, returned to Azulini Valley in southern Eswatini, where he established his village. Azulini Valley was a fertile and strategic location, and it was key to Sobuza's success. As Azulini Valley is located in the center of Eswatini Kingdom, and it is surrounded by mountains, this made it a difficult place to attack, and it also gave Sobuza control of the main trade routes through the region. From this location, Sobuza's influence slowly spread to other areas. This expansion happened by using both strong victories in battles and more subtle approaches, like making close alliances and strategic marriages. Under Sobuza's leadership, the Ngwane people integrated numerous small Sutu and Goni speaking tribes, or Emakanza Midi, such as Makakula, Maseko, and Similan. These tribes built up a larger composite state that today we call Eswatini. It was while Sibuza was in charge that the present borders of Eswatini became fully under the control of the Lamini kings. During this time of growth and diversifying, Sobuza's people became self-sufficient and skilled in defense. During the expansion, Supportive clans, including those with ancestral links to the Lamini clan, were crucial. They supplied the Ngwane with resources, especially cattle, contributing to the self-sufficiency. The Zulu people wanted the mountainous land that Sobuza occupied. However, his friendly relationship with Shaga played a factor. In 1828, King Shaga Zulu was assassinated by his brothers, Dingane and Shangana. It was not until Tingane became king that the Zulu people made an attempt to subjugate Somkrolo and his people. In 1836, Tingane's forces attempted to overpower the Ngwane people, but failed due to the lack of coordination by the invading groups. After Tingane's significant loss against the Fort Trekkers in the Battle of Blood River in 1838, he wanted new land in the southern part of Eswatini to create distance between himself and the Boers. Dengane planned to set up villages and take over. When the Swazi people understood how serious Dengane's threats were, they gathered all their military strength to defend themselves. 
Sobuza's fighters stood firm and pushed back the Zulu forces at the Battle of Lubuya in 1839. The Swazi people emerged victorious. After this war, Sobuza passed away and buried beside his grandfather, Mwane III, at the royal bridge site in Bilanini. Sobuza was succeeded by his son, Mswati, and the name Lamini changed to Swazi. Sobuza's final legacy was the envoys he dispatched shortly before his death to seal an alliance with the four trackers. With that, a framework of domestic governance and foreign policy was set in place on which his successor Mswati could build. When Sopuza passed away, his son Mswati was just 13 years old. Tandina Ndwandwe, Mswati's mother, took charge as queen regent until her son was of age. Tandile was highly respected by the Swazi people, along with other influential people of her generation, became the main group of decision makers during this time. Under Tandile's leadership, the annual Inwana, or First Fruits Ceremony, became very prominent. Inwana is an ancient custom that was practiced by various Nguni tribes, but over time, they let go of the practice. Tandile drew inspiration from her Ndwanda traditions and made Inwala a fundamental aspect of Swazi traditions. She emphasized the link between the king and his warriors. Tandile also used the ceremony to show how the nation and the king depended on each other, especially for farming. Today in Swadini, Inwala is the most sacred ceremony of all the rituals during which the king plays a dominant role. If there's no king, there's no Inwala. Sopuza's forward thinking to mentorship and succession planning highlighted his commitment to the long-term stability of his people. His enduring impact lies in his role as a unifier and a strategic leader. He successfully navigated tribal conflicts, leveraging diplomacy, alliances, and geographic positioning to safeguard his people's interests. His legacy is embedded in the formation of the Swazi nation which continues to carry forward the principles of leadership and resilience he exemplified. In Swazi tradition, Somfrono's kingship is considered second only to his son Swati, who was a strong warrior king and greatly contributed to the Swazi nation. Speaking of Ingwala, in an ancient practice that many Nguni tribes used to participate in. Isn't that so interesting? Please let me know in the comments if there are any African cultural practices, past or present, that you'd like me to cover. Please don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. I'd greatly appreciate your support on that platform. I'm also available on Twitter, Instagram and threads. Thank you so much.